filósofo, romancista, compositor, autor de libreto de óperas, crítico de vinho, organista em sua igreja local. O homem que conhecemos graças a mais de 50 livros publicados não se deixa capturar em definições fáceis. Roger Scruton, que foi condecorado em 2016 pela Rainha Elizabeth II, é conhecido do público brasileiro justamente por suas reflexões políticas, por sua inteligente e apaixonada defesa dos valores conservadores. Seu coração e sua mente, entretanto, parecem pertencer a outra esfera. My heart is in the aesthetic dimension of, of being. It always has been. No Brasil, para uma série de palestras sobre o sentido da vida, Sir Roger prefere falar de seu novo romance, Memórias de Underground, sobre a importância da beleza na vida cotidiana e sobre o sentido filosófico e existencial de ser um conservador. Nessa entrevista especial para o Spotniks e o Estado da Arte Estadão, Scruton falou de tudo isso e muito mais, e até um pouco de Brexit. Eu estava tentando evitar o Brexit porque eu acredito que... Sim, sim, por favor. É um grande prazer para mim ter aqui. Today, Sir Roger Scruton, philosopher, writer, and we're here to discuss a little bit about your work, philosophy, art, beauty, your novel that it's being released in Portuguese right now, one of your novels, and it's a great pleasure for me. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank, thank you for inviting me. So my first question, Professor, is this. There's a passage, there's a moment, a very beautiful moment in Notes from Underground in which the two main characters are falling in love for each other, they're seeing each other. And you have a very beautiful description uh, concerning the way they look mm. at each other and perceive them as persons. Mm. And this is quite interesting because it's connected to something that you wrote philosophically about, both in Sexual Desire, one of your books from the 1980s, mm. and also more recently in books such as the face of God and the soul of the world. Mm -hmm. how, how, can you, how is the experience, the experience of translating into literature something that you've been working out philosophically? Uh, very good question. Uh, uh, um, because what one is talking about when talking about the way in which people suddenly see each other transfigured in the look of love is not about something other than what they're seeing, but about seeing that thing in a new way. You know, lovers, they look at each other's face, and they look at each other's eyes, and animals can do that. Your dog looks at your face and looks at your eyes, but lovers also look into each other's eyes. It doesn't mean that they're looking at, for something else. And this looking into is, as it were, a summons of the other to appear and to transfigure the world. Uh, and that experience was very important to me uh, when writing about this situation, because I was writing about the totalitarian situation, the totalitarian uh, society in which, in which everything has been made deliberately faceless. The face has been wiped away, not just from people, but from things, from the countryside, from houses, you know, from, from uh, the people's occupations and so on. Um, it's all become impersonal, a form of control. And for that very reason, when the light of the other self shines through this, it has a particular radiance, stronger than anything that you would encounter in uh, our ordinary day-to-day -day life in a free society. And you see this in other novels about the totalitarian situation, I think, in Solzhenitsyn and Bulgakov and people like that. So uh, I took that as a very important feature to try and show how uh, my two characters are, as it were, lifted out of the sort of material ordinary, ordinariness of everything around them so as to encounter each other on another level, another plane, And that, of course, is fatal. It meant that they both had, had glimpsed another way of being and were now unable to settle back in the order which was dictated to them. So that was really the story. How did you get involved with uh, the underground movement in Eastern Europe? Oh, um, 
just, I was asked by a colleague to go there because she had some friends, well, she had made friends with a group of people who met for private seminars in Prague. She asked me to go there and talk to them. And uh, I also had an invitation to go to Poland at the same time. So I made a little trip and I was quite appalled. This was 1979, shortly after the Charter movement in, in Czechoslovakia, which was 1977. Um, I was appalled by what I encountered, I have to say. Uh, the sense of desolation of the ordinary way of life and also the, in the Czechoslovakian case, the persecution of my colleagues um, who had been thrown out of their jobs and were doing sweeping streets and things like that, but still wanting to meet and discuss ideas. So I had this opportunity to discuss ideas with them, came to know them and their network, and other people did the same. And we got together and just started trying to help. During this period, you were writing for the Salisbury Review that you yes. founded, right? And one of your books uh, by 1985, I believe, uh, Thinkers of the New Left, mm. Uh, when you first wrote this first version, uh, you have a very strong attack, a criticism, a very strong criticism of a variety of left-wing yeah. intellectuals. Most of them uh, were not so critical or at least not so open about what was going on in Eastern Europe mm. and socialist countries. Do you think that this personal experience influenced the way you look at those uh, oh, colleagues and peers. Of course, yeah. of course. I, I, I was always, I was already very hostile to the Marxist way of thinking and to the uh, attacks on traditional conservative and liberal ideas from the left because they dominated my university in London and the students were getting this one-sided diet of, uh, of arguments from the left, New Left Review and all that and were not being given any arguments on the other side. So I was already very um, engaged in the task of trying to, in trying to rectify that uh, bias in the curriculum. But when I actually went there and saw the extent to which the ideas of the left were underlying all that was happening there, they, were, they really had um, they had produced this situation. There was no, no doubt about it. It was the Marxist way of thinking that had produced this horrifying tyranny and also uh, polluted the culture and polluted the, the language with which people tried to understand their own predicament. So that gave me an added animus, you know. I came back and I wrote these articles on these thinkers and, yeah, I didn't... Um, mince my words, I said what I thought. And when it was published, that was essentially the end of my academic career in, in Britain because it was forbidden to, to criticize these people. Publishers were uh, harassed by... Yeah, absolutely, and I was harassed. And, but uh, when I republished it recently, and that is what, th nearly um, 20 years, 25 years 20, yeah. later, uh, in an expanded version, it got very good reviews because the history had moved on. People no longer um, were in the bus business of the Cold War and they, and they saw in retrospect exactly the truth of what I was saying about these thinkers. But one curious thing is this, um, if you have written the novel with the same mm. feeling which you wrote those articles, yeah. you, you would have had a very different novel Yes. Um, were you more detached about those in, well, in relation no. to this? Uh... There's no anger in my novel. Right. Um, there is forgiveness. Forgiveness of the people, characters involved. I'm describing characters in a real situation. They didn't create that situation, but they do suffer from it. And I try to find in their situation uh, the love that unites them and also the excusable faults which come with, with their predicament. Uh, and I, you know, I, I have a great belief in the redemptive character of art. I think art should not be propaganda. It should not be an angry protest against the world. 
even if you do want to protest. Uh, and novels of protest, to me, are, uh, are artistic errors or art artistic, um, what, what, I, what should I say, uh, faults anyway. Um, so, and I think if you're going to describe anything in art, you mu it must be with the intention of rescuing and redeeming the human quality within it. Fantastic. So, when you were writing early in the 1980s about conservatism, Margaret Thatcher was quite recently prime mm. minister, elected prime minister, and the conservative party was held in power for 17 years, if I'm not mm. mistaken, right? Until 1997. Yeah. Right. Um, and now, since 2010, uh, you have a conservative government yeah. in the UK. So what, in fact, political parties can preserve and conserve yeah. when they're in power? Politics is a very limited sphere. There's only a f some changes you can make. Um, my view is that a, a proper conservative p politics must do its best to conserve and to conserve the things that matter and those things are always under attack. And it's much easier to destroy things than to create them. That is uh, essentially what Mephistopheles says to Faust, and it's what our civilization has always experienced. Uh, and the Conservative Party in, recognizes this, so it's, it's always trying to stop the destruction. But it doesn't necessarily have a positive policy to put in the place. A bit because it's relying upon an inheritance as you do in a family and in your private life. Um, so inevitably there's a kind of erosion when, they're in, when the Conservatives are in office, there's an erosion of the things that they were elected, elected to safeguard. Um, that's inevitable. But um, pe the important thing is that people should be able to adapt to these changes. and. Um, the reason why they don't vote for the left, I mean, many of them do, but of they, uh, they, on the whole, they prefer to vote conservative, is because they recognize the destructiveness of the left. I think this is very clear to many people. There are people at the, you know, young people full of resentments who want that destructiveness, but they're not the majority. Most people don't want a politics of destruction. And uh, for that reason, the left, uh, however active it is in the intellectual sphere, and it always is, uh, will nevertheless not uh, persuade the people as a whole. But you were writing, at, for instance, in The Meaning of Conservatism, it's 1980, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. right? Um, you, you had a different tone when you were describing Yeah, yeah what, definitely. So, uh, what, what, what's changed? Well, in 1980, you know, when I published that book, I was still young. I mean, I was 35, 36. Um, one thing that changed is that, of course, I became more mature, more, um, perhaps more reserved, more willing to recognize that not, you can't achieve very much, mm -hmm. more reconciled. So, um, you know, Meaning of Conservatism is quite a passionate book in a yes. way. And uh, I regret that because, uh, you know, it's not a passion that could endure. And my later writings on conservatism are much more to do with the, a kind of distant, moderate um, attempt to, to, endure, or to imbue the conservative vision with sympathy not necessarily to impose it by any passionate doctrine. This is quite explicit if you compare it with uh, the meaning of conservatism mm -hmm. with how to be a conservative yeah. from 2014. Yes. Because you, you, you do a very honest effort to extract what you consider to be the truth, yeah. in a variety of political positions yeah. and ideologies. That's right. right. And you can present your case quite open and quite uh, with a, some, some sense of serenity, yeah, and it's stronger. It is it? stronger. Yeah, exactly. That's why I regret the meaning of conservatism to some extent. Yeah, the, the later book is um, first of all, it's an attempt to show why 
There are so many people who disagree with the conservative vision and, and to be respectful towards what their, what their arguments are. But it's also, I have an underlying agenda, which is to say to the opponents of conservatism that there is a possibility of arguing about these things, that you may think some one thing, but we conservatives think another. Let's, let's put this to the test of rational argument uh, and get free of this sort of hysterical witch hunting, which is the normal weapon on the, we on the left now. This, you have a very strong concern about um, uh, the environment, uh, the idea of nature, and mm. some, tr some sort of uh, uh, attachment to places, traditions, people. Yeah. Um, but part of the argument of the left was that Thatcherism attacked all that. Yeah. And this is something that we, we will find even in the, the meaning of conservatism. Yeah. Uh, some criticism of the, the way Thatcherism was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no. So, um, do you think that conservatives have evolved from this position in concerning this specific topic? Yeah. Well, um, when the environmental movement first became very loud and vociferous with Greenpeace and so on, it looked like another left-wing movement which was trying to recruit all good people towards the cause, you know, and it was one of these fist-clenching movements. We were all going to unite against the establishment and the establishment was the businesses the multinationals, the things that were destroying our environment by putting selfish concerns above the uh, interests of the majority. And there was some truth in that, of course, um, but uh, uh, therefore, because conservatives support free markets and so on, they are on the other side. And some American conservatives of the free market kind were on the other side. They say, you know, that the environment is not an issue in politics, it'll look after itself. Most of us realize that's not true and it hasn't ever looked after itself. But I wanted to point out when I wrote Green Philosophy that actually the environment is a conservative cause, not a left-wing cause. If you look at the major left-wing movements of the 20th century, they were environmentally disastrous. Uh, you know, the, um, in the Soviet Union and the Soviet occupied territories. These huge plans to build dams across rivers, to put power stations here, and to excavate open mines there, to deforest this place, move populations across the continent, all that uh, led to the total destruction of the, Soviet, uh, well, the Russian environment. And, uh, and you see in China today the total destruction of very much of the Chinese countryside. So uh, you know, this comes from having a big top-down plan all that way of doing things is environmentally far more dangerous than the, what the civil society initiatives that, that uh, conservatives believe in. So my book is about civil society, how it gets together or can get together to preserve a place as, as home. Um, uh, and uh, we have many examples in Britain. We've had, you know, um, of non-government organizations, charities which have existed for 200 years devoted to maintaining the, uh, uh, some kind of equilibrium in the environment. Our biggest charity, the Na National Trust, has five million members. It's not a government organization, but it's there to preserve the countryside and the, the old settlements and the old way of doing things. The reason why I started with a question about your novel, mm. and then we moved to some topics regarding politics and other issues, is that I'm quite interested to see how you can look back to some of your work and mm. see the connection between philosophy, your main uh, activity as a philosopher, the interests, the intellectual interests you have in Kant, for instance, mm. or uh, Wittgenstein, for instance, and the way you produce the other parts of your work. Yes. Um, I suggested that there was a Kantian way of considering the reading of your novel, for instance. Mm. Um, do, do you see uh, this connection, this holding together of all these pieces as a writer, a philosopher, a public intellectual, uh, politician? Yeah, uh, yes, of course. I, I'm, I've always seen it as one task of, of 
presenting my worldview, which uh, um, which spreads out in all sorts of directions. But uh, uh, I want to show the world as I as I see it, and I show it philosophically. I show it in fiction, and you know all, all the other things I do. And the, the important thing is for me using language correctly, hmm. because I think uh, that. Academic philosophy uses language in a most terrible way. It peels language away from the world. Most modern fiction is crude, insensitive. I think if you think about the task of an intellectual like me as one of cleaning the language and reattaching it to the world in such a way as to show the world as it is, or rather show the world as it seems, because that's even more important. Um, that then you will see that all these things are connected. This is a very... Um, th there's a possibility here, that I would like to suggest to you, is that most of your concerns, most of your work on politics depends mainly on ethical and mm. aesthetical considerations and not the other way around, in spite of the way yeah. political works are more popular. Yes. Do you feel this way? Do you have any sort of perception that what drives you to write about politics, it's not a political issue per se, but ethical and aesthetical considerations? Yeah, absolutely. Or it's... No, it's, uh, I'm, my heart is in the aesthetic dimension of, of being. It always has been. Uh, and um, my interest in philosophy grew out of that. And political philosophy I, it was never my real interest. I was asked to write The Meaning of Conservatism by one of my colleagues, <clears throat> a left-wing colleague who was doing a series of books and he didn't know who to ask to write <laughs> a conservatism book. So I wrote it um, and it was probably a mistake. Then I just sort of got caught up in this whole thing and identified as a conservative intellectual. Whereas of course I am a conservative, but I'm, I'm, my real interest, my real heart lies in literature and, and in the attempt to make sense of the world. You go and give talks in different countries and you see young people interested mm. in your work and in political issues and in conservatism, but do you think that, they're, do you, think that you gather attention when you're discussing how Proust is important or how yeah, uh, uh, I talk about what I think, uh, um, with, and I don't conceal what I think. I, um, that, uh, that's not what I'm there for. And some of the things I think about are not so interesting to people as other things. For me, they're all part of a single seamless uh, web of ideas and observations. And so I'm giving people what I, how I think things are related to each other, and it. It may be that they don't themselves see the relevance of it, but that's their problem. Starting from uh, the, you give the Gifford Lectures yes. and the Face of God, so you have then the Soul of the World and on Human Nature that were yes. at Princeton University, yeah. right? So they're, they're quite strongly attached to a, a, one, a unified project yes. concerning human nature. I see yeah. that it's ma mainly. Uh, yeah. Do, how did you design this idea of presenting those topics and what's the heart of this project? Well, I was asked to give the Gifford lectures, uh, which were established by Lord Gifford, who was a, r a religious believer um, and wanted these le lectures to be public and, re and talking about the place of the Christian faith in the wider society and it was part of his desire that the university should be a voice for Christianity in a changing world and uh, so I, I thought to honor his bequest that's what I should do I should make sure that whatever it was I wrote or gave as lectures was connected centrally with ideas in the in the Christian tradition um, so, that, so writing about the face of God enabled me really to bring together 
quite a lot of things which have been going on in my mind. First of all, the understanding of the other, the other as a face facing me. The understanding of the world as something which also stands in a kind of personal relation to me. Uh, and um, the understanding of things like representational painting uh, and um, all, uh, and arts generally. So I, I brought all these things together uh, under the idea that if there is such a thing as, uh, as understanding and relating to God in this world, it must be derived from these experiences. It's our way of, as it were, uh, extracting from those experiences their metaphysical heart. And, this, and that, I was really inspired writing about this because I, I thought it was... Uh, people hadn't properly grasped this before and, and it is a way in which we can confront some of the very some of the more destructive kinds of scientific ways of thinking that have emerged in recent times under the influence of neuroscience and Darwin and all that. And then I moved on from there to the soul of the world which was essentially giving a more a metaphysical underpinning for the, for the face of God by talking, by developing an argument as to how we understand each other in two different ways, both as a physical object, a bio biological process, if you like, and as a personal, a, a, a personal being in personal relations with ourselves. And so I developed that in a more technical, slightly more technical way, but also bringing in art and architecture as well to, to, um, to give a to flesh, out, flesh it out. But the two books are saying essentially the same thing in different language. And then in human nature, I just say it directly as a philosophical thesis right. without, without all the embellishment. Yeah. There's a, there are different um, uh, intellectual adversaries, not enemies, of course, mm. but uh, uh, with you, you were disputing some topics. Yeah. Uh, one that uh, is quite interesting you mentioned is uh, neuroscience, mm. that it's uh, getting more preeminent in the humanities. Yeah. How do you see their actual uh, contribution to the humanities and to understanding of the human nature? Well, I, I would say so far the contribution has been zero, <laughs> um, but others would disagree. Um, but for a start, all that neuroscience has done so far is take ordinary experiences and stick an MRI scanner on the head. Uh, you read in Proust, they have an MRI yeah, uh, and they yeah, have, think they have something about you. Yeah, and or something about Proust. But it, <laughs> but it, all, it, it all falls to pieces in your hand. Because first of all, the MRI scanner doesn't track thought. It just tracks some of the aftermath of thought. Um, uh, and anyway, we just can't get in there into that great web of neural connections. And more importantly, and this is something that Peter Hacker and others have rightly said, our language with which we, the language with which we describe our mental states and through which we relate to each other mentally uh, is not about the brain, it's about the person. And, the, and a person is not identical with his brain. He is a complete organism. Uh, and that complete organism is essentially involved in relationships with other such organisms to disentangle in some way uh, the, the, the emotion, the inner, the inner subjective state and attach it to a little strand of synapses. That is not, not just impossible, but also wouldn't produce any understanding either. So I'm, I'm very hostile to the, the way in which people try to claim advances in the humanities through uh, relating it to neuroscientific jargon. Because it is only jargon. There's another uh, field of adversaries, intellectual adversaries, that could be described mainly as utilitarianism mm. in a variety of senses. And that there's a, some point in, on human nature um, you're yes. arguing with uh, Peter Singer and Derek Parfit and yeah. on, he, on his uh, What Matters. On what yes. matters. And you describe them, in, if I'm uh, remembering correctly, as well, they present uh, what they think are moral problems 
in terms of the trolley problem and the challenge of yeah. a boat that will be sunk or something like that. Yeah. But they leave everything that is properly moral outside mm. of the problem yeah. and they get only a, a rhythmatical yeah. uh, idea. Um, what's, what's your take on this now? How do you consider this uh, problem of utilitarianism now? Well, if you can reduce all moral choices to a cost-benefit calculus, so they become economic choices, that's it, you've solved the problem. You've not got any moral problem, problems anymore. And when someone has no pro moral problems, he has got the greatest of all moral problems. You know, and that's so obvious when you look at Singer and Parfit, the moral emptiness of their, uh, their language, the way, their way of describing people, their sense that there isn't any difficulty here. The fact is there is a difficulty and that difficulty consists, as someone like Levinas would say, it consists in the face of the other. The, 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 this absolute forbidding that, uh, that comes before you with the presence of the other person, which says, you know, here your calculations stop. Um, and the fact you can produce these trolley problems and lifeboat problems doesn't alter this. It just shows that moral problems really are difficult and can't be solved by arithmetic. But do you think that utilitarians can be presented as a moral theory? Because it seems to me that they do not grasp actually what is a moral no, theory. Uh, no, absolutely. They, uh, it's a product of a, a very de deprived vision of the world from which the human has been excluded. Uh, it's, an, it's an economist's rewrite of the human condition. I see. What was the most important thing for you back then and what has changed in 30, 40 years in which this yeah. urban scenario is completely different? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, of course, I'm a bit of a romantic uh, and uh, I was m much more interested in the old schools of architecture. Uh, I spent, when I was 21, 22, I spent a while in Rome uh, and got really interested in the Roman Baroque. What was it that made people build in this way? And also the Roman form of urbanization in which houses are stacked against each other and there's always some little detail which makes things fit together. Uh, and so I got really interested in the, if you like, some, something I would call the fabric of a city, the way in which it is stitched together around a place and makes that place sacred uh, and also makes it a home to people. Um, so I, that's what really interested me. Uh, why is that so important? And what is the aesthetic experience that comes from it? So I wrote about that in the Aesthetics of Architecture. I, over the years, I've come back to do, write little essays, partly because of feeling a certain revulsion for most of the modernist styles that have since become dominant in our cities. Um, and trying to point out to people that building that way is not making a place, but annihilating a place. And um, that is popular among many people who read it because they feel the same. But it's not popular among architects, of course. <laughs> um, it's, but I, I, I've recently thought I should come back and write something a bit more, as in the conservative thing, something a bit more um, serene and forgiving about the whole thing. But do, do you think that it's possible to have uh, something interesting in architecture, that it's not only a revival yeah, of something of the past? Uh, of course. I think you know, though we, it's very important to remember that all of architecture in our tradition has been a revival. You know, um, Roman architecture was a revival of the Greek, which was itself derived from what people had done down the centuries in that part of the world. Roman architecture, it lasted, it became the Romanesque and then the Gothic, but it's the same ideas. And then when people wanted to renew everything, they revived the original uh, um, Roman orders in Palladio and people like that, or Brunelleschi, first of all, but then, uh, and then again, there was another revival in the 18th century. Then in the 19th century, they revived the Gothic. And then there was another revival of the classical, etc. The modernist, 
styles are the first non-revival style in the whole history of architecture. And that's one reason why people don't like them, because they seem not to have anything in common with what has gone before. Um, in architecture, as in furniture and clothes and everything, we want small gradual changes, not these sudden radical and destructive remaking of the whole, of the whole architectural order. When you were, uh, since we're talking about architecture and uh, ways of attaching to uh, some places and ideas um, and forms, uh, when you were writing uh, Beauty, mm. uh, you got, uh, we, we, the readers get the sense that you were trying to make the case not only for art, but for a general experience. Yeah. You just mentioned to us uh, that this particular book and the documentary, the film that you produced mm. for BBC, uh, was not only a great success, but uh, struck you as something that impact people all over the world. Yeah. Um, can you tell us how do you perceive this right now? Why is this the case? Well, the, the, the book on beauty, uh, and we were talking about this before, uh, it, it is a distillation of my thoughts over 40 years on this topic. As a result, it's quite dense. It's very philosophical. It's not easy. But um, it, I, I then had the experience of making a film with this excellent woman, Louise Lockwood, the producer, who forced me to express those ideas in a more demotic uh, uh, vernacular idiom um, and to find the images that corresponded to those ideas so that I could address people directly. So we ended up making this film, which was for the BBC. There was a, it, was, it had to be part of the, because it, was defending a particular vision. The BBC had to have somebody attacking that vision as well. And because I'm right wing, they had to have two left wing people's, people attacking it because that's the way you have balance in the BBC. <laughs> um, but those other two have been forgotten. Their films were rubbish. But here, this film has not been forgotten. The BBC tried to make it forgotten by taking it down off the YouTube. But there is the pirated version with Portuguese subtitles, which is there and which people look Resilient at. It's contribution. Yeah, and I, I have constant correspondence from people, artists, uh, not so many architects, but ar artists certainly, and ordinary people saying, thank you for saying this. It's what I've always felt and not been able to find words for, that beauty really is fundamental to my own life the life of the people I like, that I look for it everywhere. Without it, I'm not happy. And I recognize that it's not just a matter of taste, it's a matter of being in the world in the right way. That's the sort of thought that they all express in response to this, which suggests that I did manage to put my finger on a truth that we all can recognize, not necessarily in the, you know, in the best language, but at least I got somewhere. Now, uh, part of the caricature against the argument that, presented, that is presented in Beauty and in the documentary mm. Why Beauty Matters, part of the caricature consists in taking that you, you would not appreciate, you would not be something that someone who would appreciate modern art, mm. modern architecture, modern music, or even contemporary. And it seems to me that it's quite blatantly false to say that mm. because we know that you're, you, you, love, you love T.S. Alice, poetry yeah. and all that. So what would be the difference? It seems to me that you were not trying to make a case only about art in this documentary and in the book, no. uh, but of the static experience in yeah. a broader sense. I was, of course, very concerned to address the ordinary person who is not particularly interested in art, music or literature, but to show that for him too, Beauty has a central place in life. So I talk a lot about what I call everyday beauty. Right. The ordinary ways in which we arrange our room, our clothes, our, our residence, our, our surroundings, um, the way in which we lay a table and all, the, all those things, um, which is part of explaining to people that actually beauty matters to them, even if they don't care much about art. But then, only when we do see that, 
where we see why beauty is important in art too. And because it's, it's the aspect of human life that art wishes to lift out and immortalize. And to say that this is not just part of our everyday being, but it also contains the secret of the meaning of what we do. Do you have some particular uh, modern composers, for instance, that you really appreciate in the, way, the same yes. sense that you uh, appreciate Bach or Beethoven? Yeah, of course. I mean, they're, they're, they're modern composers, there are many different kinds. You know, uh, modern music began, as did modern everything else, in the sort of 1910s uh, you know, with the Rite of Spring and Bartok's string quartets and, uh, and Schoenberg's um, serial writings. I appreciate that, much of that, enormously, and also what's followed. But then there are periods of pure barbarism, periods where there's not music but sounds only. Someone like Stockhausen, you know, I think of him as a, a charlatan, and Boulez likewise. They have, you know, very subtle theories with which to justify themselves. But anyone who depends upon a theory to justify his art is not an artist. And, and I think so we had a whole, after the war, a whole series of frauds who took over. But I think they're being swept away now and we're going back to a sort of uh, regular modernist idiom which is connected to the classical tradition by melody and to a certain extent by harmony and by rhythm. Um, and that's the kind of music I like, and I, there's a lot of composers writing that music in Britain and America, uh, more than perhaps there is here, you know. Um, although, though of course, some South America made its contribution in the time of Via Warbos and Joachim um, Terra and so on. Right, right. Um, so one shouldn't despise any country. Of course. And do you, do you feel the same about art, about yeah, painting? Sure, but um, art, because visual art, there's an unfortunate feature of it, which is that you can own it. Right. So, so you can buy it and then people compete for it and the critics can come along and say, you should buy this because it's so hideous, it must be good. Um, and so you have this competition to produce original things and to own them and put them on your bathroom wall. Whereas, in fact, the regular production of beautiful portraits and lovely landscapes, all that is going on still. And you have artists like David Hockney still doing serious representations of the world as it is, or um, Lucien Freud, etc. Um, and uh, they are, uh, you know, they tend to get eclipsed by these frauds like Andy Warhol, who, ha who had nothing to say. All he could do was paint a, a Brillo box. Even a known uh, representation of painting, such as Mark Rothko's, for instance, yes. I, I think that I could experience uh, most of your description of a static experience in Rothko Chapel, for instance. Yes, uh, Rothko is an interesting case. There is something serene and, and you know, calming uh, and um, otherworldly about his paintings. Uh, but we have to acknowledge that there's only one of them. Hmm. It's been made, done many, many times, and sometimes it's more successful than at other times. Right. right at the beginning of How to Be a Conservative, you say that the option of, became, of being a conservative was open in 1969, 1968 for you because you were a British. Mm. That's for people that did not belong to that particular tradition, that would probably be not the case. Mm. What did you mean by that? Well, um, what did I mean? Uh, 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 we actually have a party which describes itself as conservative uh, and um, there's been a long-standing political tradition, in, especially in America, which is entirely devoted to conserving something, that original gift of the Constitution, in the case of American. America. If, if for us, the original gift of the monarchy and the common law and parliament. Uh, and um, so, whereas so much of politics elsewhere in Europe and in the West 
there, either that original gift has disappeared um, or it's been replaced by a violent revolution which is trying to put, be put in the place of it but which doesn't succeed in being in the place of it because the, the attempt to conserve a revolutionary worldview is self-destructive. You, you, know, you can only put another revolution in place of it. And French politics is a very good illustration of this. You know, the, the French Revolution turned everything upside down, caused uh, horrible deaths and um, uh, a destruction of the economy and the, uh, and the social texture. But uh, people clung to their French identity. They got through the worst of it, but they did so only because Napoleon is set, took over and externalized all the chaos. Uh, you know, he, he was a very great illustrator of the second law of thermo thermodynamics. <laughs> if you can e export entropy, then the, the system can continue, which is what right. he did. But he, in exporting entropy, exported it all over Europe and destroyed everyone else. You know, and that led eventually to the world wars of the 20th century. So, uh, final questions. One. This year, you were subject of a vile attack by the New Statesman magazine in which they had this bogus interview with mm. you and they put words on your mouth, they misprinted you, everything that you said. Uh, and the Conservative Party at that moment sacked you of mm. a position uh, you had uh, as head of the building beautiful. Mm. Uh, how is how is this a testimony of our times? Well, it, it, it's a testimony to two things, really. First, that the conservatives, however, whatever political power they have, are very scared of the left. And they're very scared of, uh, of these uh, meaningless thought crimes that can be attributed to them. You know, they're, they're just they don't know how to deal with it. So they run frightened and say, let's get, let's get out of this. That's the first thing. The second thing that it showed is that the Conservative Party in Britain has lost all sense of what it stands for. It, it, it refuses to take a stand on something absolutely fundamental, which is, first of all, uh, uh, the assumption of presumption of innocence, should it not ask the person that is about to sack what he actually did say, you know, should, it, should there not be some attempt to put it all at a distance and get the truth? So all that, you know, which is one thing that we should stand for, the idea of due process under law. But threw that away uh, and also threw away the, 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 um, its obligations to its leading intellectual. You know, uh, uh, if, it, if, if, if someone like me matters so little to the Conservative Party, well, to what extent can you think it actually has a Conservative doctrine of its own? You know? So I, I think of it as uh, this episode as part of the loss of its identity that the Conservative Party has gone through. It, not, it wasn't me who precipitated this, it was the whole Brexit thing and you know there, there was no leadership at the crucial moment when the Conservative Party should be giving it. Thank you, thank you very much for this Professor Scrutzen. Well, thank you. We do appreciate everything that you wrote and it's a pleasure for us to have you here today. For me too. Thank you very much. <laughs>